Hi guys, um, let's uh, kind of talk today about the peripheral vascular disorders that we cover in adult. Uh, specifically, we'll be discussing PAD, or peripheral artery disease, and PBD, peripheral vascular disease, with varicose veins and phlebitis. So the first one is peripheral artery disease. And this is a disorder of the arteries um, due to arthrosclerosis, but peripherally. So in an other video that I have, we talked about the arteries um, surrounding the heart. Well, these ones are just like the ones basically peripherally, like in your legs and maybe your abdomen or other parts of the body. Not related to the heart. Um, so PVD basically is, as I said, uh, due to arthrosclerosis, is that thickened or kind of fatty deposits of, you know, cholesterol or lipids, they kind of get hard and they make the arteries narrow. And then blood flow cannot um, go through or flow as it normally does. Uh, lots of risk factors that leads people to develop peripheral artery disease. Some of them are smoking, uh, hypertension, high cholesterol, like a bad diet, sedentary life, obesity, uh, diabetes is a huge one. Uh, anyone above the age of 50. Uh, also, in, in addition to all those, um, stress and some hormones uh, can lead to uh, peripheral artery disease. And it is most common in African-Americans. So normally what we have is that your arteries, you know, have a normal blood flow, um, all your molecules, you know, kind of flow through it. But then within the wall of the vessel, it starts forming this plaque and this buildup of fatty, hard deposits. And it occludes the, the vessel, you know, eventually. So then it decreases the blood flow and it can lead to clots and other issues like lack of perfusion and wounds, ulcers, etc. So how do these clients sort of look? Well, particular for peripheral artery disease, and, you know, you're going to hear me say PAD to kind of in a simpler and shorter way to say it. Um, PAD, people have this pain whenever they are ambulating or sort of doing some sort of activity. And the proper name for that is intermediate cloudi cloudication. Sorry about that. <clears throat> so now what they see is that the pain sort of gets better whenever they rest. So they might be walking or sort of doing some kind of activity and then they start feeling the pain. But once they sit down and rest their legs, the pain sort of subsides. Um, they'll get a thin, shiny skin, um, kind of like the picture right here that you have. They also become hairless in a way, so they kind of lose their hair. Their nails become thick. Um, and when I talk about nails, I'm talking about the toenails. Their pulses are going to be sort of uh, decrease or in worse, worse um, scenarios, they could be absent in which that leads to severe, um, uh, severe impaired circulation, which then they might have to get amputations. Um, they get this numbing sort of burning sensation. Um, as well as as this coloration on their skin where it turns pale when they elevate the leg due to the lack of blood flow or this sort of reddish kind of um, wine color, brown, dark red uh, whenever they hang their leg or in a dependent position. Um, and that's just kind of with uh, blood flow again, you know, whenever it's dangling, all the blood flow or the minimal blood flow kind of goes down to the extremity. We diagnose it mainly with a Doppler ultrasound. So 
um, the physician, if they suspect that someone has peripheral artery disease, not only are they going to get the physical and history of the patient, they might also get like a lipid panel just to see if their cholesterol is, you know, high or whatnot. But in order to see the actual plaque and the blood flow specifically of that artery, they will have to do a Doppler. Um, and in this case, it's like a duplex uh, ultrasound and Doppler ultrasound with image where they could see the actual uh, blockage as, as you see in this picture. They could also order something called a segmental pressure study, which is sort of like a blood pressure with the ultrasound on the thigh or knee or ankle. And then um, if the blood pressure drops more than 30 mmHg, then you, you sort of um, have peripheral artery disease. They could get angiograms, um, which is the blood flow uh, with sort of um, dye of your vessels to actually visualize the lack of blood flow as well. The problem with the PAD is that, you know, the lack of circulation, the lack of blood flow does not deliver oxygen to the tissue, nutrients that we need. So, you know, they become um, uh, very prone to ulcers and wounds uh, to the worst case scenario amputation. Um, they also develop this critical limb ischemia, which is like severe ischemic events of the leg whenever it's at rest that lasts for more than two weeks. So you might have your typical patient that might come into the emergency room saying, I've had this wound, uh, wound for, you know, days, it's not healing. You get a little bit of history. They got all the risk factors, you know, they're obese. They have diabetes, they have hypertension, um, they have high cholesterol, uh, perhaps they might be African American. Um, and then, you know, when they go and do these studies of the leg, uh, like an ultrasound, they, you know, realize, okay, this individual is not really getting blood flow to the extremity and no wonder, you know, why they're developing wounds or it's not healing. So what I'm trying to say is that blood flow, it's very crucial for someone to have um, nutrients and oxygen and not develop wounds, okay? So the treatment for uh, peripheral artery disease consists of, you know, of course, reducing all this cardiovascular uh, risk that I've been mentioning, like lowering your diet with trans fats and saturated fats, as well as not developing diabetes, controlling your blood pressure, um, uh, diet low in salt as well, not smoke, uh, not uh, drink alcohol, exercise, and then sort of prevent these complications like developing ulcers or wounds or amputations. Whenever it's so occluded, then you might want to, you know, what they hope to is to restore the perfusion on the leg. Now, there's a couple of things that we can do. You know, we can do some medications as well as some um, procedures to actually uh, remove that plaque. Now, we do want to encourage them to continue to exercise, and they are recommended to exercise 30 to 45 minutes uh, three times a day, and it could be something mild like walking or biking. Um, meticulous foot and leg care, they should inspect and clean as well as lubricate their leg to prevent any cracking um, or any slight crack or opening of the skin where bacteria can get in there and it can lead to an infection. Um, same as protecting their feet, you know, with the proper shoe wear. Um, as I mentioned, you know, they, they sometimes they start developing neuropathy where they do not feel when if, let's say, they get a cut or they step on something. So, um, observing their feet and me meticulous foot care is very important. 
And then resting and supporting um, the symptoms. Um, and some of the symptoms, like if they have pain, they could they could um, use supportive hoses. So let's talk up a li little bit about the medications that they use. They talk about giving these patients um, antiplatelet agents such as aspirin. <clears throat> In this case, it's like a baby aspirin is 81 milligrams. Or another antiplatelet medication is clopidogrel, Plavix. Now, both of these inhibit platelets. So let's go back to my, let me show you over here. Let's go back to my blood flow here um, image. If I, have, if I have my vessel wide open, well, the red blood cells, the platelets, and everything else just flow with no trouble. <clears throat> However, if I start developing plaque and it starts making my vessel narrow, platelets will start aggregating. Same with this plaque, it kind of makes a, it damages the vessel the wall of the vessel specifically. And so the body is going to try to repair it. And so platelets start aggregating to that. And then from there, um, everything starts like adhering to it. So red blood cells, platelets, and then you start forming a clot. But if we can inhibit platelets by doing or giving them an antiplatelet agent, then the risk of um, not developing a clot, it's, you know, of course, higher. So now a couple of things to keep in mind with antiplatelets is that, you know, the patients are at risk for bleeding because you're inhibiting their platelets. Your The platelets could go low. And specifically with aspirin, um, they should take it with a glass of water. Um, they should also like stop these medications if they're going to have a procedure like specifically like dental work or any kind of major surgery. They might ask them to stop the medications before. And then um, they could develop ulcers in a GI upset. And some people are allergic to aspirin. Many people are. So you want to educate them with all the preventions and all the teaching of whenever they are at risk for bleeding, like um, whenever they shave, uh, try not to shave, you know, with razors, uh, soft bristled, you know, toothbrush, no contact or heavy spores, no falling, uh, pressure on their cuts if they do have one for, you know, a while etc. Just to mention a few. Another medication that we can give them are uh, cholesterol reducers, and these basically reduce the cholesterol um, and that plaque, right, that is sort of uh, being built up so it doesn't get it worse. Um, and some of these are the H MG-CoA reductase inhibitors, the end in statin, um, so simvastatin is one of the very common one. Uh, careful with uh, these statins because, you know, they can cause muscle pain and weakness and sort of develop or progress into rhabdomyolysis, which is like the break breakdown of the muscle. And that increases the creatinine kinase levels, which are sort of very harmful to to the kidney and the, it throws the patient into a, sort of a kidney failure. Um, another category is the fibric acid derivatives. And these have fibrid in the middle, like phenofibrate. So they have F-I-B-R in the middle. You should monitor your liver enzymes and also they could cause GI issues like nausea and diarrhea. Another classification that has nothing to do with platelets or um, cholesterol that we use in PAD patients is ACE inhibitors. Um, and for ACE inhibitors, uh, they basically reduce the symptoms, um, allowing you know more blood flow, not allowing for the vessel to constrict um, because it inhibits that. Uh, um, the angiotensin, aldosterone, and it does it. So anyways, it just doesn't allow the 
the smooth muscle to constrict. So in, in a, an a option for ACE inhibitors are Ramipro. Ramipro. Now, if let's say medication is not sufficient and, you know, maybe this client has maybe about a 90% blockage or severe blockage in their extremity, then they could go in and literally um, either take out the plaque or put a stent. Now, if you have heard already seen the lecture on coronary artery disease, I talked about uh, heart cath or um, heart catheterization. Well, it's kind of the same thing, a catheterization, but in the lower legs or in peripheral, peripheral arteries. So in this, it, it's still the same name, it's called percutaneous transluminin angioplasty. And so they go in through your femoral artery. Um, they put this uh, stent or balloon that, well, catheter that at the end has a balloon. Um, and then they could inflate the balloon and it sort of smashes the uh, plaque. And then if a stent is needed to allow for blood flow or for the vessel to be open, then they could also put a stent. Um, now, this ensures restoring of the blood flow. Now, could they get clot again or blocked? Sure, you know, if they don't follow the post care and their diet and whatnot, they can get clot again, but initially it does uh, restore blood flow. Um, after this procedure, it's very important that. <clears throat> we monitor vital signs that we monitor for hematomas at the insertion side that um, that they monitor, the nurse monitors neurovascular checks like pulses, color, sensation, pain, and mobility every 15 minutes um, up to the hour. Um, they also apply sort of compression at the femoral artery just to make sure it doesn't bleed. And then they ask the patients to uh, not bend the knee except whenever they're exercising. So a little bit of education comes whenever these patients come back to your floor after the procedure. Um, oh, needless to say, I forgot to mention, you know, they, they, you do have to get a consent for this as well. Another procedure that they can do is the arthroctomy, and basically is a rotating tool that literally just shaves off and removes that plaque. So that could be, you know, for a client that might have 100% occlusion, you know, um, they might just have to take it all out. Other restoring perfusion um, procedures um, or for revascularization are by bypass grafts. So, you know, let's say, for example, in this photo here, you might have a total occlusion on that artery coming down um up to your knee and then they have to bypass it because they cannot fix it well they'll get like a graph from maybe um another part of your body like another blood vessel or it could be a man-made tube and then they sort of sew it to the top part where we have blood flow and then bypass it you know bypass the blockage and then saw the other part to the bottom where we have regular blood flow. So basically bypassing the block. Um, so that could be another um, procedure to restore perfusion. Um, then last, it could be that they might have to open the artery and remove the plaque. And they call this endotorectomy. Um, where surgically the physician will remove the plaque by making an incision into the artery. All right, so what do we do if these patients have um, an ulcer? Well, what we 
do want is to keep the legs dependent, meaning going down, because if we elevate, we are decreasing the blood flow and we don't want none of that because they already have decreased blood flow. If they develop the wound, these patients require dry dressings. Um, you can medicate them for pain control. Uh, very, very important their nutrition. It has to be with high proteins, vitamins, minerals for healing. And then occasionally when they develop an infection, they might need an antibiotic uh, to sort of help with the infection. And worst case scenario, if we have really bad necrosis or gangrene or no perfusion at all, then the only solution is surgery and possible amputation. Now let's move on to um, venous insufficiency or a basically um, disorder of the veins. In this case, we're talking about the veins, not the arteries peripherally. Um, we also call it um, peripheral vascular disease um, or, or venous, uh, excuse me, venous uh, disease. So basically in here, we have these veins that are just incompetent, you know, they're, they're not working correctly, they're not moving blood flow, this can be kind of chronic, um, the walls of the, the, of the veins become weakened, the valves damage, and so in the long term, you know, you just have everything pulling down in your leg because the valves help basically propel the blood flow back to the heart and when they fail and the walls fail everything sort of sinks you know peripherally like in their ankles and their feet now there could be um, different causes for this blood clots uh, varicose veins or just unknown and there's a lot of stuff that make you at risk for venous insufficiency, your age, women, because of our hormones of progesterone. Um, if you've had a history of clots like deep vein thrombosis, pregnancy, obesity, um, being tall or sitting or standing for a long period of time. So us nurses, especially females, uh, we're probably a high risk for eventually for venous insufficiency, if you think about it. Now, watch how these look. They look a little different. So you're going to have a lot of edema with these clients, um, especially when they stand for a long time because the blood is pooling and kind of stinking um, in, their, in their legs. The pain is worse when you stand, and that happens again because of blood pooling. They have this sort of um, crackly and flaky, ishy skin, um, and their skin becomes sort of thick, okay? Um, the, you're going to see sort of like wounds in their, in their color, um, kind of gets into like this brownish, um, kind of bluish turn to them. Um, and, and, you know, and, and they could have these um, ulcers, they're called venous ulcers that are very um, odd looking and deep, sometimes all the way to their bone. And I'll show you here a picture soon, okay? So... What do we do to treat it? Well, we can do several things for these clients because blood is pooling in their extremity, in their legs. We want to help them move this blood up back to the heart with some compression therapy. And this could be like bandage compressions and whatnot. When they develop venous ulcers, and let me show you the venous ulcers. Look how raggedy, like very, the edges are not perfect. They're deep. Um, they're infected most of the times, um, and they're wide. And you're actually always, I'm going to say almost always, um, you're going to see them around the ankle. 
um, they're, they're usually not um, high up in the leg. It's usually lower by their feet and their ankles. So if they do develop these wounds, then you want to do moist dressings, okay? So there's a difference between PAD here because um, PAD required dry dressings. With venous insufficiency, you want moist dressings. You still do a diet high in protein, vitamins, and minerals. You will treat with antibiotics if it's an infection, okay? Um, you will maybe, if the edema is severe, you might have, you might get an order from the physician to administer a diuretic and elevation, so elevate the leg. You are going to possibly medicate them prior to wound care coming and deep breathing the wound and doing these dressing changes. At times, the wounds are so deep that requires surgical debriefment. So where the surgeon goes into the operating room and kind of scratches everything, all the, all the dead skin and tissue. And sometimes they require skin grafts. Um, and then you educate the client about keeping their skin moist whenever, you know, they have it. So that way the cracks don't open and don't get in infected, avoiding standing or sitting for a long period of time, um, sort of uh, elevating the leg, applying the compressions and replacing the stockings <clears throat> every four to six months. So here's a little uh, easy to remember. You think about arterial, uh, you think about it's cool to the touch, you have decreased um, pulses, you've got thick nails. Um, they kind of use this Dr. EP for dangle legs. You'll have the rubber or that reddish looking to them. Um, and if you elevate, then you have pale legs. Versus Venus, they're usually warm to the touch, they're swollen, it's like a brownish color, and the skin is thick. Here's another one. You're welcome to pause the video. And here's another one. All right, so let's talk about varicose veins. And, you know, varicose veins, um, we still have an issue with the veins of um, peripherally of the, um, of the legs. But in this case, these veins become all dilated and twisted and the valves, they just don't work anymore. So you have swollen, twisted, and dilated veins with incompetent valves, and basically cause this, they cause in patients this like achy heaviness, um, pain, especially when they're standing or sitting for a long period of time. Varicose veins sometimes are very visible on clients. You can look at their skin, you can be at the mall, and if someone is in shorts, you can actually see it. They look blue, they look sometimes purple, swollen. In some, you know, they are kind of mild and just they look like spider web uh, or spider veins. Um, so, so they also cause like kind of cramp like sensation and tingling at times. Who's at risk for varicose veins? Well, women and Hispanics, uh, us women and the hormones, Jesus. Um, the age, as, as we age, you are higher risk for varicose veins, obesity, standing, poor posture, constrictive clothing, and pregnancy. So what we do for these is that, honestly, most of the times we really don't do anything. <laughs> most of the time, you kind of start seeing them. Uh, the only thing that you kind of see initially is just this bluish kind of reddish appearance of like spider veins. When they become problematic, where your symptoms are so severe, then you might, you know, you might 
go into cosmetic uh, procedures or or other treatment. Now, so initially you might just do preventive and conservative. So us nurses, for example, they tell us, hey, you know, you're standing for many hours. We're bending, we're twisting with this, with that. Listen, you should get support in um, your stockings, like your for nursing stockings to kind of help things get in there and help for your legs not to get swollen and all that. Well, that prevents it. So some of the supportive treatments is compression stockings, compression socks. Um, you can do straightening exercises, losing weight, elevate your leg, especially after a long day of, you know, walking and standing. You might have to elevate your legs and then resting. There is a procedure that's called sclerotherapy, and this is only cosmetic. It sort of um, makes the varicose vein disappear by collapsing it with a hypertonic solution. So I'll show you in this video, but, I mean, I'm sorry, this video, now this picture. So someone comes, whether it's a doctor or a specialized nurse, comes and injects a hypertonic solution into the varicose veins, and that shrinks the vein, collapses it, and the, the view, the aesthetic part, um, is not there anymore. Now, some patients, they just hate the look of it, and they resort to this. Um, but honestly, guys, like, they come back okay it's not it's not a permanent thing they will come back uh, especially if you're not taking care of yourself now after the procedure some of the things that you have to educate the client on is that they must wear compression stockings and they should not travel long distances for a week and last but not least let's talk about phlebitis Phlebitis is sort of an inflammation of the wall vein whenever um, an IV is inserted, um, and it's most common in the hands and in the arm. Now, some of the people that are higher risk for this is people that are have an IV, okay, that they are in the hospital. So our patients are going to be at higher risk for phlebitis. Um, it could be due to irritation from the catheter, or maybe they are getting very um, an infusion of irritating drugs like vancomycin is very common for this, uh, potassium. Let me see. Um, trying to think. Potassium, vancomycin, iron, I think is a little bit irritant. A lot of antibiotics, not just vancomycin, but I know for sure vancomycin. Um, and then also if the catheter, it's placed in the wrist or in um, antecubital area, any kind of flexing area. Because the more you're flexing, the more you're irritating the wall of the vein. Patients often complain of just pain, tenderness, uh, warmth, redness, and this palpable cord um, that sort of kind of looks like that. Sometimes it's not as visible as this picture, but sometimes it is. Um, and then how do we treat it? Well, you know, we actually remove the catheter. We, we change the catheter. We take it out. Uh, usually this resolves the, the issue, let the vein calm down, let the vein um, uh, come, come down from its inflammation. Um, if you have a lot of edema, we might put uh, warm compresses with, with moist, like with uh, kind of like get it, um, kind of get it wet and warm um, and then elevate the arm or hand. If the pain is severe, which Personally, uh, I, usually it's not that severe, but if the pain is severe, we can give them NSAIDs because NSAIDs help with the inflammation. But we don't go really into big narcotics or anything like that, okay? So this resolves on its own pretty much and is supportive treatment. Um, 
remove the IV, elevate, warm compresses, and just maybe a little bit of inset. Okay, here are my references, and um, hope this was helpful, and I'll see you in the next video.